Pleasure. Can you all see my main screen? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start now. Uh, is there any questions you have? Because this is going to be an interesting lecture. I'll be going back and forth. And uh, I will ask you a few questions. I'll talk about the course as well. But as a typical example, patient comes to you, it's usually always a visceral crown. Um, you can see the perforation there. And this is not the actual original work, which goes, there was perforation, but I prepared the tooth and I put this crown back. Always I want to have a photo because I was in a rush. I didn't take a photo initially, but that was the case. I thought it makes a good sense. And uh, when you think about this, uh, is it you know, resistance or retention? You know, that is the question. Is there anything missing? So, you know, back to basics. So it's important to understand that today we've got a lot of um, emphasis on bonding zirconia. We've got a lot of emphasis on bonding, well, EMAX is great on the selected testes. I like EMAX, I love EMAX. I use minimal zirconia, but I have my reasons, so it's up to you. Alex, you know that I do. I mean, Alex, what, what, what percentage of my crowns are metal ceramic? And what, you know, and what percentage are zirconia? I mean, there's a lot of EMAX we should do together. But yeah. What what, what percentage of zirconia? I mean, we will do at least what, what, 1,200 units a year? How many yeah. of that would be metal ceramic? If it's uh, between metal ceramic and zirconia? Oh, a good 900 of them, Sarkis, I think. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, if there's any questions you have, you can ask my technician and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, just be open to the situation. But the problem is that we live longer. We live longer and, uh, you know, we have concerns for our patients. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the problem is that we got a short clinical crown. I mean, how important is to understand what a short clinical crown? So the important thing to understand is that before you look at any short clinical crown, you have to ask yourself, can this be restored? And, you know, restorative risk assessment should include a number of factors. I call them 10 commandments, and there's more to this. There's a lot more to this, but 10 commandments is quoted in most of the literature. That is the ask position of the tooth, like you said, Alex, where we all said, strategic value of the tooth, overall dentition, the prognosis of dentition, periodontal considerations, naturally, crown to root ratio, into arch, into arch space, occlusion, you've got enough room to build your occlusion height. We had perforation before. Intra arch. You know what that means? Does anyone, Christopher Howard, would you mind telling me? You're the English expert here. What is intra arch space occlusion? Within the arch itself. Thank you so much. Thank you. And actually, the endonic status can it be treated or not? Uh, and the status that's important also the patient factor. So we're going to be looking a lot of this. And one, and the reason. Uh, why uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a few more things missing here from this equation. And we'll talk about the next few slides. But uh, why is it missing? This is just as important as any of those considerations. Is because, uh, you know, basically, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but so basically one blind follows the other. And they're quite as such. So in other words, when you look at a paper, they're all quite the same reference in that paper. So I read this one, same reference. I could almost... Read an article, no one's written the article, okay? But no one actually looks outside. So if you're a, a new graduate, you go into specialty, you're doing postgraduate diploma course, such as mine, and you're reading it, you say, well, that's what it. There's nothing else to think about. And there's a lot more to think about than what's called literature. And that's called experience. That's called knowledge, called feasibility. That's how we do things. So important to understand that all the 10 commandments are important. There's two other commandments you'll discuss in a minute. So, and... Uh, this is what we talk about in the college, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions later on now. We go for systematically teach you how to connect those dots. So I asked certain questions, and that was a well good question asked initially about what's an ideal prep. There's no such thing as ideal prep. It's case by case basis, side by side basis, and patient by patient, by patient basis. And when, when I've been asked sometimes, can I just do uh, you know, uh, the poor seven years, or can I just do the two frame management? Yes, you can, but they even ask me a question about, well, how did you work that out? And how would you work this out? So, well, you haven't done diagnosis and, and treatment planning. Well, uh, maybe I should have done that first. Maybe you shouldn't. Uh, what about the, how did you get the bite trap? Well, you didn't occlusion. Well, what do you mean occlusion? I can get my crowns right. Well, hang on a minute. Occlusion, not just tip time is again, there's far more to it. You know, what occlusion prescription do we need to give? For instance, 
you know, if you have experience in orthodontics, it will help you to understand occlusion a lot better than if you had no experience in orthodontics. So I can tell you for sure. Because Roth in 1995, who was one of the fathers of orthodontics, he said orthodontics is a process of an animal. And to me, I mean, in many ways, that's a fantastic philosophy to, you know, to, to go by in your practice because we all have a philosophy that we treat our patients. And that's very important to use your philosophy because, you know, dentistry is not an exact science. And so philosophy of treatment of patient care and tooth conservation to maintain teeth and their comfort and their function and biopsychosocial well-being for their life, as long as you're alive and function that you're going to be their dentist is very, very important. So we talk about those little things. So this is, in this particular instance, uh, all these crowns on posterity are all um, metal ceramic. This is an implant, I think one of those is implant. Whereas from, from the anterior rounds are some, there are some veneers and there's some Emax crowns. So we're able to mix and match, but get a good aesthetic outcome for those patients. Coming back to our patient. Well, we're gonna start with the anterior tooth because I think in many ways, um, part of the learning process is to see something different. Why am I saying to see something different? Because you know the answer is for this. You're going to tell me what? I want a question. Why would you treat this patient? Somebody please tell me how would you treat this patient? Please talk. And you got adequate bone, you know, measurely, labially, legally. How would you treat this patient? No one? I'm going to start picking somebody from the board. It depends on the age, son. She's 50. I guess you just give her options for missing missing tooth replacement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it, can I ask a personal question? Yes. If it's your wife or your mom, okay, or your mother-in-law, right? How would you do this patient? <laughs> she must have said the last one. Uh, <laughs> No, no, my life I, I just very much, so just get on with your question. <laughs> I, uh, I assume an implant would be ideal here if there's adequate bone. Right. Are you sure? What would, why would you say that? Why would I say that? Well, uh, PA looks like there's adequate bone height. I can't see bone width, but I think you said there's adequate bone width. Uh, what are our options? So we've got uh, nothing, which is silly, denture. Uh, she can't stand it. That's why she came in. Yeah, she can't stand. It. Okay. Well, I think it's either it's either um, denture, bridge, or implant. Really, they're the three options. Okay. Now, this you know my questions are always tricky questions because that's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can always do implant for this patient. There's no question about that. But I'm sort of looking at the rest of the mouth, and you can see these crowns are all. Um, uh, zirconia type crowns, behavior cement. Can you see the cement? Okay, now I know the dentist is a conscientious dentist. She's a conscientious. She said this is a beautiful dentist which she's done and been there for about a good 10 years. That's fine. Things do sometimes break down in everyone's hands. But uh, you know that the problem is that in the early days when they did the, the crowns, they used to do hand milling and then the milling wasn't as accurate or the impression wasn't accurate. So there's always a gap between the, the, the crown margin and the two for is never sit properly. And you can see a lot of these margins, they're so everywhere, some of them are repaired with composites. You probably can't see them, but I can see other problems here as well. You can see the peri, I didn't show peri because I want to concentrate on the on the on the two or the site. I didn't want to go about the peri or et etc. There's a lot of other issues this patient has, but this is really important to her, and I want to address this issue real quick. Uh, and uh, well, oh, sorry, I, so if I can cut your feet on, do it real quick. Just uh, elect, elective endo and post buildup, I guess, is a good way to start. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, the funny thing was, the patient referred this to uh, another colleague for implant placement to periodontist, and 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 uh, was referred. And and I asked the patient, why were you referred for implant placement? She said, well, uh, she said there's something in my tooth that she couldn't remove, and this is right here. Okay, so obviously the root therapy was tried, but they failed and uh, and the dentist chose not to send the patient to the end of or I mean, to me it's not an issue, but uh, that was one of the reasons, okay, to convince the patient. But I said, look, you know what? I said, I, I can easily remove this. So that was one of the 
treatment plan. So we decided to do uh, we decided to do um, initially to save this tooth, but there's going to be a reason why I save this tooth, and I normally you know like to do that for a patient, right? It's asymptomatic. Obviously, there's some sort of treatment being done. Some dressing has been placed. You can't really see this case, but also, um, but also, um, uh, you know, when I'm implant was mentioned to the patient, and she said, uh, "Look, I want to look at my options." And the patient was told, "Look, you know, you can't really have anything else because there's no tooth structure." Now, those of you who had experience, do you think we got enough tooth structure to place a poster in core and uh, build this tooth? No one? Isidora? Uh, how long do we want it to last? How long would you want it to last? Isidora? Well, if it's a temporary measure uh, to get her by, to get the perio under control, sure. Okay. So how much can you grab this? Um, how much can you grab this? Well, to the crystal bone. Right. Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm here somewhere. I'm sorry. Anyone can make a comment. How long do implants last on the anterior region? Maybe you should look it up. Okay. No takers, Christina? How long do they last? Hmm. Well, who, who's doing the, the treatment? Well, are we talking about longevity of the treatment for this patient? What would you say to the patient if the patient said, you know, I want to hang on to my teeth? We can give it a go. Exactly. We could give it a go. So let's keep going. Let's keep going this case. Uh, see, when I, I mean, patient basically does on implant, and then she made it very clear to me. Uh, and uh, to be honest with you, implant would have been my first option of call here, okay? Uh, because uh, there'd be a number of reasons you can talk about it, but uh, let's go a bit further on. And you can see I'm looking at the position. I'm, you know, in many ways, why do you think there's two fractures in the first place? That's occlusion. Right. So there was a. Sarkis, a uh, Ryan is asking for an ortho extrusion. Who's asking? Ryan is asking whether we can do an ortho extrusion. Yes, we can come back. We can come to that in a minute. I will come back to that. But the question is uh, it's occlusion consideration. Okay. Now, remember one thing that. I have considered ortho extrusion, and I'll come back to it in a minute. We'll talk about ortho extrusion. So it's interesting, isn't it, that we talked about all the other factors before, all the Ten Commandments. I just go back. We talked about all the Ten Commandments, and this is in the literature, but literature hardly mentions occlusion. So it astounds me because, uh, you know, when you think about I know we need feral effect, we did post design, we can do root therapy, internal external bevels. Don't worry about the internal bevels, just remember external bevel. Crown root ratio, adjacent teeth, general dental status, you understand. But the most important thing is, you know, what about occlusion? What does occlusion translate to in the real sense? What does it mean, occlusion? It's how a teeth come together, but in many ways, what does it say? What does it do when you? put teeth into function, it's forces, isn't it? It's about forces, correct? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sarkis, Archana is asking, why did this occur in the first place? Is it occlusal consideration? Question mark. Well, I'm talking, it's right the title there. If you look at the title, it says, what about the clue? Okay, so the, the question is being answered. Thank you for the question. So, what about the occlusion? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's think about this. There's more to it than just occlusion, because when you think about this, there's a 
common restorative design. Okay, and uh, there's been no real thought process in terms of restorative design to get good contact points and reduce the loading on the anterior teeth, or maybe something's happened to the posterior teeth and patients are now using more the anterior teeth to be able to chew and function, so increasing stress that allowed this to happen. Would that be possible? Is that a possibility? Is it over? Close. Right. Okay. So I think about this and uh, uh, I think occlusion is very important consideration here. So if I'm going to restore the teeth, I think endodontics is not an issue. We need to look at the amount of tooth structures problem. And my aim would be to, at the end point, to reduce the forces of this tooth because this is a really sick tooth. Is that clear? So for me, I need to look at all those factors that we talked about right in there. And when I think about it, if you think about orthodontic extrusion, uh, what happens to the root ratio in the extra teeth? Increases, correct? And for a 50 year old woman who presents in your practice, that may not be the best option. It might probably push it towards implant. Am I making sense? But it's a possibility of discussion and options can be discussed with the patient. But I'll come more into crown to root ratio in a minute. So when I think about this and uh, look at the protected occlusion because it's in between, it's not the terminal tooth. So my chances to start to improve as time goes. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, next thing to consider is what about a core fatigue? Because when you prepare teeth, you age the teeth. You put the teeth to a lot of aging process. So that's something is to consider. And if you're going to prepare the teeth and have lots of open margins, you suddenly put a tooth in question into a guarded prognosis. So therefore, every time we talk about cutting teeth, you got to think long term in terms of what is going to be your final you know, restorative or clinical outcome that will improve the patient's oral health and well-being, etc. And to be honest with you, in this case, the patient is very really happy with a smile with a color, but underneath there, there were a lot of problems brewing. And minimal recall was provided to the patient. Remember we talked about initially when doing this dentistry for patients, we need to make sure that maintenance protocol is very important because that's important before you start the treatment. The patient cannot commit, you don't start the treatment. And I say to this patient, I said, I'm not going to treat you unless you commit to the maintenance protocol. And that was a part of the parcel because if my work fails, it's not my problem because I didn't see it. Similar with that implant case, patient didn't come back for four years, not my problem. Okay, I haven't seen the patient, can't make a comment, I haven't seen the patient. So it's not like they lived overseas, there was the COVID, they couldn't come back. No, they chose not to come back and they need to take care of responsibility. So it's very similar to this particular case. So let me think about our case, for instance. So here's the situation. We can see that I can get good three millimeters and three millimeters ferro is very, very crucial. It's critical to a good crown, you know, retention resistance outcome. Most of the books will tell you one millimeter and that's absolute nonsense. One millimeter doesn't mean much to me unless I'm going to definitely lose this too. So I'm playing long term, I like three millimeters. Uh, and uh, I have adequate tooth there to carry the post, etc. To me, that's not a problem. So then again, we, you know, do the root canal therapy. In this particular case, I did the root therapy for this patient. You can see the open margins and legends. Can you see the open margins? That's one of the next to go. So if you're the implants, then we have to think about a lot of other teeth in the mouth. So that makes things complicated. So this is a simplest way to go. At least we try to maintain what the patient has, gives them time to think about the case. And naturally, 
Minimal preparation, you want to maintain minimal to dental removal, you want to maintain the core root strength system. That's what you should do. And we know that we live good fiber with GP. This is more than that. We've got adequate length. You can see I remove very carefully here. I use a hand instrumentation, remove a perca. That gives me a good seal epically. And then the problem becomes is how do we take an impression of the post nearly what, you know, 10, 11 minutes long? And how do we prep will come out to it later on? But most important thing is that Laurie will say to me something important thing called biologic width. So what would you say about biologic width? A lot of you really uh, been hammered about this. What would you say about biologic width? What am I going to do when I do this preparation? Can someone talk about it, please? Okay, I'm going to make a pick. Can someone make, okay. Okay, let's have a look. I like a... No one wants to come in? Jeffrey Poon, would you make a comment, please? Go ahead, please. No one. I'm happy to listen. There's no wrong answer. I just want to be able to. Uh, Natasha, how about if you talk to me? I think everyone's sleeping now. I'm not sleeping. I'm listening. Okay. You've got actually an answer. Someone said the apical margin of your prep should be about 2.5 millimeters above the crystal bone to allow for connective tissue health. I may be wrong. That's okay. Well, it's, an, it's, it's not a bad answer. So two, two and a half millimeters above the connective tissue, correct? Was that right? Sorry. Am I, am I above later? the crystal bone, 2.5 millimeter above the crystal bone to allow for the connective tissue health. He says he might be wrong. I may be wrong. No, 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 no. don't say you're wrong. I mean, <laughs> you give him an answer. That's a wonderful answer. And it's good. But what happens when you have to, you know, uh, uh, be able to sort of hang on to this too? I mean, there's, a, there's an issue. There's a, we need to look at this. And uh, in this particular case, for instance, uh, I need to be able to, you know, grab as much two structure as I can, especially when you think about it. If you have a problem, and uh, suddenly I promise the patient I will try to hang on to this too. And that's the point I'm trying to make because, uh, you know, people don't, don't like to discuss this in, a, in the literature because it's very easy to take the tooth out for an implant. But what about if the patient is medically compromised? You could put an implant in. So what are you going to do? You know, do you need to learn these techniques? I mean, we teach it at the college. I'm talking about we teach at the college how to deal with these cases, how to plan these cases. So, and the other thing is that if you have a high smile line and in you know, 90% of all the patients, actually 100% of all patients with a low smile line do shop a pillow. So they all have 100% gummy smile. That's a well-known article. So a lot of uh, authors have you know, published this. And, uh, you know, what would, would you still consider those people being crown Nathan or uh, would you consider orthodox exclusion? And that's something to think about. Or would you still consider having an implant in this case? So now we start thinking about not just tooth, but looking at the rest of the teeth and the prognosis of the rest of the teeth and informing the patient that we do have a problem. Now, patients are adamant about getting a front tooth fix. This is an aesthetic emergency. Because for her, a livelihood stops because you have a front tooth. I mean, no one will walk out without front teeth. Okay, she got this um, uh, partial um, denture. Uh, that's removal. She clicks on, but she can't stand it. Nothing removal. So, if a person not even wear it. So, the question is that it is an aesthetic emergency. The thing that, what would you do? Now, um, I was mentioned early by a colleague uh, that um, two and a half millimeters above the, above the crestal bone. And you're not wrong. You're, you're absolutely right because. Uh, uh, literature quotes, literature quotes, 
that magic was about 2.04 millimeters. You said two and a half, that's good enough. And uh, that's the connective tissue. The dental gingival junction is about here, and you got the, um, uh, the junction epithelium about there. So in many ways, connective tissue is about 1.07 millimeter in attachment. Sulk is about 0.69 and epithelial attachment 0.97. If you add one, two, three, that gives you about 2.04. And is that correct? Have you, have you all ready on the UL? You all have been well informed about this, haven't you? Is that correct? No takers? I'll look at the chat table. Okay. Are we all agree or we don't agree? No? Agree, agree. Agree, agree. Okay. <laughs> hmm? Yes? So it's a measure. So how, how did, you see, the problem is that this will be called teach you in the colleges. When you have certain numbers, well, they teach you, well, how did you get those numbers? So you got to go back to the original paper. This is Gargulio's paper in 61. And everyone quotes this paper nearly more than a million times, probably 10 million times. And it's the same paper, you know it. And uh, Terry Walter, Professor Walter, was the, the first clinician to actually uh, talk about this, saying it doesn't make sense to me, because when you look at the same paper, there was a range from zero to 6.5 millimeter. Circular depth, that's your little pocket, from zero to 5.3. Your epithelial attachment, you know, from 0 0.08 to 3.72. And this is only a simple measure. That is a range. So biologic width is range. It's not fixed. It's side by side, varies from side by side in the same patient and varies from patient to patient. So the question is, how would you determine biologic weight knowing what I'm telling you right now? So how would you determine? Is it oral? Good question. If I put you all on a standstill position, that's what mm -hmm. teaching is about. See, um, the college teaches you how to think. I know there's a lot of other courses out there who give you the recipe. But then again, you can create your own recipe. You can add some bit of salt. You can add a bit of pepper, a bit of turmeric. You can add a bit of a Moroccan salt. Make that a little tasty. That is you. But most of all, maintain biology. And that's a recipe. That's the best recipe. You see, this is not being taught because when you go, to, if you're an undergraduate, you know, the teacher tells you to do this and do that. And you do what you talk. But it's not real experience, you have learned. We start asking ourselves questions in terms of what's the best way. So where do we go from here? I'll just receive an SMS, Pooja. Uh, where do we go from here? How would you determine your biologic weight? Uh, Natasha, you go ahead. Because I'm going to ask a lot of questions. So if you can't answer, Natasha, don't be upset with me because I like you very much, Natasha. Okay. Don't be upset with me. I'm a good boy. I promise you. What exactly is your question? How you determine biologic weight? Well, you told me there is no such thing as biological weight. No, there is a biologic weight. I never said. Yeah, that. but you said okay, fine. There's no fixed dimensions. Yeah. Okay, so how you determine? Okay, let's get okay. John Tran, how about you? Ken, or, or John Tran or Ken Robbie, who wants to come in? How you determine biology weight? Bone sounding. Bone sounding. <laughs> bone sounding. So sulcus, you know, bone, bone sound, sound, bone sound measurement why. minus the sulcus depth. So how do you do bone sounding? Probe down to bone, but the bone. Probe down to bone. Right. And that will give you roughly an idea, correct? The answer is correct. Yes. That's right. So you got it. So before I start telling the patient where I can save the tooth or not, I will do all my measurement. Is that clear? So, you see, the, the old scenario is that before, you see, most of my time when I'm seeing patients, I have to say, 
oh, the doctor said, I need this, 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 I'm looking at it. You're okay, fine, fine. You know, maybe the doctor meant this way. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. So what I'm trying to say is that when we speak to our patients, we need to be taking a lot of information, like taking a lot of diagnostic information, thinking about it. And then getting the patient, I'll get the patient back in my room where I'm here, right here. There's a screen there, a white screen, and they see their case. And I explain what I'm thinking. So they are important decision making process. So they understand the complexities and the difficulties that's involved. So for me to say, I think if I have now room, I might be able to save this, save the day. And that's what we exactly did for this patient. So we, you know, we have enough room in this patient to create good three millimeters, still maintain some position for for the uh, tissues. But biologic adaptation is far more than having that marginal um, safety zone, okay? Marginal safety zone. And I'll tell you a bit more about this as we proceed. So how do we construct the pose? We've done the therapy. Would we cast or we direct such as stainless steel or fiber? Oh, by the way, do not use titanium direct pose. They're brittle and they break, all right? And so this is stainless steel post. And uh, they should be round in diameter. Use the thinnest one as you can. But you can see that as the same patient now. And I have created a good more than three millimeter of ferrule, haven't we? Yes or no? It's the same patient. Okay. And I know for a fact that I can go inside after my root therapy. You can see how smooth this preparation is right down. The bone is about here, okay? Bone is about there, okay? And we don't use cutting birds, use special type of birds that we get that nice smooth surface of the root. And the other important thing is, well, how did you get down there without causing a whole lot of bleeding? Because I know when you do those subjugal preps like it was done here for this patient, they've destroyed all the attachment of paraphrase, that's why we have a conversation. So how am I gonna do this without causing conversation? I'll probably nick the gingiva here already if you see that. I'm not really worried about it. Okay, so there's a special technique you teach at the college. And then the next difficult part would be is how do we channel impression material right down there to get that effect for the post? So normally you've been taught you use a bit of a, uh, you know, patent resin or uh, this other type of resin, so you put a special plastic post, you take a pad and you prepare it. That's too much expansion, too much um, errors in that because you actually can stress the root and you can snap this root in half. But this is something that Alex gets, okay? And Alex knows that the first thing my instruction will be in there will be cobble plates. So we'll be cobble plating this, the whole thing, and that makes his life very easy. Is that correct, Alex? Yes, it does, yeah. Copper plating is just like there's no chance of anything chipping. I mean, <clears throat> when you when you pour into an impression like this, there are so many little sharp edges and little corners, particularly if you have a look at that little dip on the labial portion there on the preparation, like those thin edges um, don't, you know, you, when you separate an impression, anything can happen. You can have a little bubble, you can have a little bit flaking off, Whereas once you copper plate, it just it um, picks up every surface without any bias. It just attaches itself to every nook and cranny, and then it reproduces itself. So we very good. Uh, now the other thing that might be asking is is when if you if you pour this without like copper plating, the chances are this post will bend, so you're going to get a wrong post, which will create a stress into the root system. Correct. So correct. what the copper plating does, it stiffens the whole thing, so it can easily work without distorting the model, you know, you've got exact replica of the model, correct? Correct. So to answer the question is, we just say this too far, I need to go a number of important steps to be able to do what I need to do. It's not just simple, take an impression to the lab, fix it. And I'm gonna stick it on, I'm gonna push that post so hard, so in, in about four months time, they'll be cracking. That's what happens most of the time. You can see the round preparation of the post as well. So. To, to go from here, what we understand is that I cannot rely on a post and core for my restoration. It's basically to allow me stabilize the whole tooth and core system, but my main restoration 
is based on the remaining two, okay? So if you place a person in core and try to hang the crown on the person in core, you're stressing the whole root system. This is what people don't teach you, okay? You can't rely on foundation restorations of your post in core, okay? Because you don't know how it's retained. I will never trust any post in core unless I know the clinician, take some x-rays, look at the, in the mouth, the type of work done, so I know that clinician has been pretty good and I'll be very comfortable, make my assessment, okay, or how do you know other factors in, how long it's been in the mouth for a while. But nevertheless, let me show you another case that gives you an idea of what do we do, and the finishing line has to be way below, I'm going more than probably a good four millimeters here. So that's enough to retain a whole single crown, even sometimes with other person, I'll show you a case in a minute. But it is important to understand where you're going. And if you tell me, would you have a shoulder or, or would you have like a shoulder there? No, the answer is no shoulder. It's a long knife edge margin, okay? I'll have a full gold crown that goes way below there. So this is the same patient who fractured the tooth on the lateral in 2018. And you can see, for instance, uh, that's a post that's cast and uh, it's fitted the copper dies. And uh, that post is very, very passive. And you can see as I'm turning the die up, this is a crude passive test, the post drops. And that's what happens. It's about retention resistance. It's very important to have a really passive post. And the crown will go and embrace the remaining tooth structure. And that's important to understand that, you know, time is an essence and uh, then we restore this patient. The trouble is things happen in people's life and then disappear. And they can't control that. But nevertheless, when we're restoring teeth, you give the best chance that you can. So um, the patient returns after three years, uh, family issues, you know, wife's not well, terminal cancer, can't look after himself, carries, work issues. Look what happens to the rest of the dentition. So loss of support, uh, still the implants holding things and we had to repair this tooth. And that's still holding on my crown and it was taking a load, so I reduced that and try to make a good canine contacts. But unfortunately, tooth number one one is fractured. But funny enough, the composite crown, the billow hasn't fractured. The one here hasn't fractured, but the zirconia one has fractured. So what do we do in this particular case? So coming back to our patient, here's the tooth that's fractured the root face. And this is the problem we have. You can see poral hygiene, number of issues don't even go there. We have, you know, you don't, you sometimes, we can't tell our patients where have you been because they're looking at the mouth tells a story. We have to sort of feel for them. So look, you know what, we're just gonna do caries control. We'll just sort this crown up because the musician is to speak to make a living. And then we bring him back to get his life back together. He says, look, I'm getting my life back together. There's no problem, we understand. Let's get you sorted out. But nevertheless, we have to hang on to this too, okay? Implant is still not an answer. We can start doing implants. There's other issues in the mouth money. Certain amount of money is to spend anywhere else, you know, in, 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 you know uh, to get the best optimal results. So, you know, don't, I try to use the minimal option. Unfortunately, we can do anything else. He can't wear a plate. He's a singer, and that's important. His tooth is very important, especially anterior tooth for phonetics and aesthetics. So having said that, what I'll demonstrate to you is having even as simple as, I can get good three millimeters here as you've been you know, aware before. We place some pins there, crowns made, and um, you know, in basically uh, the crown um, is on the copper die. It grabs both the pins and surrounding surface. Um, and I'm gonna demonstrate with this video so you can understand how important it is when you're looking at biology and maintaining the integrity of the residual tooth. Let's look at this. I'm hitting it labially and palatally. Shows you that you have the right resistance form and the mouth extension, or there's a minimal amount of work that's present 
you still have good resistance and retention. So it's about resistance and retention. It's how you achieve that's crucial. Because the chronic cramps wouldn't say the test that I'm doing right now. And you can see where the right. neural map is referring. Okay. So by having a special design, okay, you can do, okay, this is never semi crowns that just show this angle for me. Yeah. You just as minimal now. Sure, you're going to rebuild that, but you can see when I go back here and I place my crown. And yes, two minimal gold margins here. Okay, now press hard. Okay, now be here. Not this version. So that's the advantages of metal semi crowns over any kind of zirconia crowns. Uh, okay, so basically, um, basically, before we go to the next one, you can understand how important this is when we design the restorations. Is there any questions on this case so far before I go to the next one? Any writing, any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Uh, none as of now, Dr. Sarkis. Just, we can wait for maybe a minute. Okay, good. Uh, so the aim was that you can do this with metal ceramic crowns only. You can't do this with zirconic crowns. Because, Alex, why you can't do the zirconic crowns? Uh, you just, you're not, you can't get the ferrule effect. That's the, um, it's not, you don't have the malleability of the, um, that the alloy has. Um, that goes around those thin metal margins to knife edge. And what's up? What's I mean, what would be if you had to do zirconia here? Uh, how much strength do we need to get? How much thickness do we need to get adequate strength, especially on the parallel side? Oh, uh, 0.9, well, at least one millimeter. Yeah. At least one millimeter. Yeah, and and we can't sacrifice the tooth. I need that parallel to last thing, the tooth, don't I? Yeah, I mean we can we can keep the palatal aspect of the 0 0.3, 0 0.35. Yeah, 0 0.3, that's right, 30 micros. Look, if it was your mouth, seriously, would you go for zirconia or would you go for metal ceramic? In this case, for BFM. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions you have on this before I go to the next stage? No questions, Dr. Sarkis. Fabulous. Fabulous. Now we're going back to the initial slide. And again, we can see here, uh, for instance, where, uh, you know, there's a perforation, muscle dislodgement, so patient comes to you for assessment. And when you roll the crown, it's quite obvious that on a distal margin, uh, there's a minimal thickness. We just, there's nothing here. So Dennis keeps resemantic, resemantic, and said, look, you know what, you need implants. So patient decides, Look, you know what? I used to have a prosthodontist in South Africa and I'm going to find a prosthodontist. So she finds me and I come in and naturally I agree with the patient that there's other ways of doing it because she rang the prosthodontist in South Africa and said, look, find a prosthodontist. Not because I think any of would restore that is with the same thing, but that's how patient came to me. It was with her. Uh, so, but patient was left high and low by a local dentist who said, look, you know what? I uh, can't treat you. I don't know what to do. I can put some resin, but never gave a solution. So you uh, participants would have good understanding as how to have a good solution for cases like this when you have those patients. And because the idea is again, uh, you know, I think the dentist was afraid to invade biology with because the gums right there. So the problem was, well, how do we go in solving this problem? When you think about it, this is a, a after preparation and crown wool temporary, you can see the level of the depth that we have achieved for this patient. And uh, you can see the distal margin. We had to go quite deep, about four, five, five millimeters, and grab that structure with the tooth. And also, you can see the whole margin. And gums appear nice. This is after the temper has been there for about two weeks. A temper crown, so gums still appear quite well. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the grooves and boxes uh, that are placed. You can see some grooves here, there's some here and some here and some here to 
help me to give me additional resistance because there's ethical resistance just in case. And uh, is there any reason why would I go and put additional boxes and grooves because I feel I've got enough height. Anybody else can give me an idea? Uh, if you can't, I understand, but um, is it not what you, you're, you're thinking? Come on, give me an idea. Why do you think I would put additional grooves here? Uh, Anti-rotation. Okay, point taken. You want a hint? It's a hard one. Loca location. Location where? Mm -hmm. So it, it positively fits in, otherwise. Okay, all right. Like you, know, you can fit. This is definitely fit. I, I, I get where you're coming with, uh, Christina. Anything else? Why well, I want that extra resistance? You always got to ask yourself a question. The crown was there for a while and then something happened. So obviously must have been probably related to occlusion, right? In a, in a way, correct? That is a dislodged. Pressure was a problem. Yeah, occlusion. Yeah. yeah, shine Shine says occlusion. Yeah, but also if this is a terminal button, right? This is a terminal too. This is it's subject to a lot of loading. So you're going to have a really good resistance for it, okay? More bonding length. Well, it's the, it's the weakest, cement is the weakest form. I mean, you know, I mean, let me let me tell you, if this was a corneal crown, Alex, I'll tell you, in your opinion, Alex, yeah. from a clinical point of view, okay, which yeah. is easier to remove, a, to, to cut and remove, bonded Emax crown or bonded in inverted, you know, uh, uh, in inverted, uh, uh, the, or bonded, um, uh, zirconic round. Okay, are you talking hot bonded zirconia? No, just normal bonded. Okay. Like you know, using a Z prime and they're both okay. They're both they're both hard to grind through. Once you get through the zirconia, you you could you can't you could split it. Um, whereas with the Emacs, once once you perforate the actual core, you still have a better bonding surface to surface contact than you would with the zerk. The zerk would is hard initially to grind through, but once you split it, you can um, you know pull, put it into two pieces. Okay. I like the second part of your answer for the zerk, but I can tell you zerks are so easy to cut. They're not hard at all. It's the Emacs that are the hardest to cut and hardest to remove because you can't remove it. You actually have to cut like a whole crap prep crown for the Emacs. It's far more stronger than zirconia. So that's why I don't see a lot of use for zirconia. It's easy to meal and stick it in, but it's so easy to remove because you actually can never bond zirconia, I can tell you. People that are bonding zirconia, I'm not sure, but let me tell you, when I, when I cut a zirconia crown, it just flicks off, okay? It's hard even to remove a PFM, that's cemented with zinc phosphate, than zirconia. That's my experience. Now I've removed thousands of zirconia crowns, I can tell you. So easy to remove. EMS is a hard one. So, having said that, when we look at the crowns, that's the new one, and that's the previous one. This is the original extra. You can see this basically is a distal margin here. You can tell, you can tell the, the difference in, you know, in the distal margin. I mean, it's chalk and cheese. So, had the dentist advise the patient that, yes, he can prepare a deeper crown, and, but he was afraid of, you know, invading a biologic width. That's what he thought. The gums are there. I just don't want to go near it. But also going deeper has got its own problems too, because then we have other problems such as, uh, such as uh, we, you know, this is a preparation which you did, a new prep. You see how deep my pricks are. I mean, that's the gum level here. Can you see the gum level right there? I'm way below, okay? Uh, that's a bone. Um, my pricks are about here. I think they're here, I'm not quite sure. I'll find out later on. But, uh, and this is the, the, the original crown that's placed. You can see how much extension we have from the original crowns. And uh, if there's any question, please talk to me. And please ask me questions. I'm watching it so I can answer the questions. So in many ways- mm -hmm. Dr. Sarkis, we have a question from Naveed. Yeah. He says, uh, would you consider replacing the amalgam core in this case at all? I, I wouldn't because the amalgam core is very well 
uh, packed. It's got a pin there. The, if I remove the Melbourne core, um, let me go back. Here's your Melbourne core. And if I remove this Melbourne core, okay, that's been there for some time. And the chances are, and when it was placed, there was some, the gum hypertrophy wasn't around. So, and it's really well packed. So when I looked at it, there's no open areas. There's always some corrosion of the amalgam, but sometimes it's a good thing, not a bad thing, because it seals the margin. So if I remove the amalgam core, there's a good chance we might end up creating bigger mess than we initially have. You might even crack this tooth because all the stresses that are built up can be released and you're in a bigger mess. So I'm happy to maintain the amalgam core because my margins are on the tooth, not on the amalgam, okay? But we know from the past, you can place margins on the amalgam if it's, if most of your margins is around the tooth and the amalgam is well supported. So amalgam is retentive on its own. In other words, your foundation restorations are retentive on their own. So it's not helping, your, your crown is not helping to retain the foundation restoration. It's like when you take your temporary crown off and your whole composite core comes off, which I'm sure happens most of a lot of times, and you say, not a problem, you just put some uh, you know, dual cured composite, you just stick it in, that's the end of the story. What saves the day is the remaining tooth structure that gives you no retention resistance. So I have to answer the question. But nevertheless, this is the idea we need to do to get it. So my crown margin should go beyond this amalgam up to about there. So let's have a look. And uh, that's before. That's my margin there, past the amalgam, as you can see. That's my margin past the crown, and that's my margin past the amalgam. There's an ample, ample area here to be able to restore this too. So this is before the old crown. This is my preparations, okay? Now, uh, this is a, uh, we have a couple of plated dials. I didn't use a couple of plated dials the pictures to take the pictures, but you can see how much room we have that could extend this tooth to grab this tooth. And from here, from here, and we are able to place our gold crown that sits perfectly in this particular patient, okay? Naturally, my question would be, what would you be your occlusion prescription? And I would consider doing that as a flat occlusion, flat occlusion table, clear of all the excursions. The only time I'll have is, you can see a little blue mark here and I would remove this blue mark over here, a little bit here. I'll maintain just a point contact, okay? Point contact, and I will remove this one. I'll have just a single point contact here, there, maybe just the beginning of here. This is incline, and that incline of dislodging force of the crown, I would eliminate that, which is already done anyway, okay? That's the issue. Now, if any way I had a problem that I couldn't eliminate this, then I should have thought about this before I place the crown. Okay, you could sometimes explain the patient to just imposing to it because it's over erupted into that space. That's a possibility, but you have to explain that before you do this treatment. So patients fully understand. My patients want to know everything and I'm happy to explain what my intention is, how I'm doing it. And then they'll probably say, look, doctor, I trust you, just get on with it. And that's the good news, so you can get on with it. But nevertheless, I said, yeah, trust is not good enough for me. I want you to understand the problem. So that's very important. So that's important part of your, uh, you know, centric in ICP or MIP. ICP is in the cuspal position. MIP is the medium in the cuspal position, like a snap closure. That's what you want. So that's important part to consider. Now, let's look at a possible historic scenario, how it, this, this problem could have happened. Like, let's see another patient that hasn't started the problem yet, but if you don't do this properly, the problem will start, okay? In this particular patient with adequate occlusion vertical donation. So that's, and patient uh, has been in under personal care as well versed with the situation. But we have a short clinical crown here. This is my favorite coffee maker person, Anastasia. She said, Sarkis, I need my tooth fixed. My dentist says, I need the crown. Can I come and see? I said, Fine, just get the dentist to give me a call. I'm happy to make you know organized time. And she said, Well, this needs a crown. And the first thing that she noticed is Adora, what do you see about this too? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Erosion. Okay, besides the erosion, I'm looking at this particular crown. Let's look at only this tooth. 
Okay, let me give you history. Let me give you history, okay? It's symptomatic 4-7, frac finder, mesial lingual cusp here, mesial lingual cusp there, okay? Am I making sense? Dr. Uh, Sarkis, we have two questions. Uh, um, I guess that's for the previous um, case with the gold crown. Um, Shri Priya is asking what burrs were used to make the grooves uh, slash boxes. I like it. And uh, Nithin is asking what specification on alloys for gold crown should we communicate with the lab? Oh. Too much. <laughs> no, it's a good question. It's a very, very good question. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Hang on to that question because I need to come to this. I want to answer this first. Okay. So is it, what is your first question? You've got symptomatic ML. When the patient buys on frac finder, she just jumps. What would you do here? Anyone. There's no right or wrong yeah. answer. I just want to get a dialogue going. Stand still band. Okay. One thing. What's another way? Cusp capping. Cusp capping. Fine. What's another way? I'll ask you tricky questions. Is I like it because H Hadil says adjust occlusion. Adjust occlusion. Yep. Adjust occlusion, which we did. Thank you, Habil. I'll reduce the ML cast and the patient feels that was fantastic. The next question is when are you going to crown this tube? So what would you do in this situation? She's happy to come and have a crown done. So H Habil, would you crown this tube? Yes, um, sorry, question. Would you crown this tooth? Crown this tooth, yes, please. Um, would consider some sort of cuspal coverage. Mm -hmm. See, let's say let's say you decide to place a cuspal coverage. How much tooth do you have to reduce? Yeah, it is a short crown. Um, it's a short crown, right? Yeah, so that's why I said cuspal coverage. So some form of conservative onlay would be ideal. Very good. And if you place an onlay, it's a short crown, how are you going to manage occlusion? And this is to everybody, not just for you, my love. And I really appreciate you coming on board and being courageous enough to help me with this question. You and I are going to solve this question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, the patient has, sorry, um, the patient looks like they have wear, like, generally everywhere. Yeah, so, it looks like they have um, reduced OVD anyway, generally speaking. Right. Can you see this tube is perfectly this premolar? Can you see that? It's perfect, isn't it? The premolar. Yeah, it's not too bad, is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it might be related to the way they um, function laterally. Okay. See, I've, I've got, I love this middle picture because I don't know why it came up so quickly, but the reason we have a medial lingual castle flexion is because of this position, right? Can you see that? Yeah, there's a contact there. That's right. Can, you, can I tell you how hard it was to take that photo? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's hurting the patient. And she says, my lecture is very important, Anastasia. She's a beautiful lady. She makes the best coffee, by the way. Cafe Camaray. Best coffee in town. Okay. Best. Am I right, Bibek? Natasha, you don't drink coffee now, but. Yes, Bebek, Doctor. Nice. No, 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 I, I like hot chocolate. The best coffee in town. That's right. Bibek, don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> best coffee in town. So the question was the question was, the question was, this patient's bruxing. Okay, is is wearing some of this? It's very interesting type of bruxa when you think about it. Uh, she comes forward anteriorly, and she she wears she actually locks right into here, right? Locks into this place. So my answer uh, to her is that we can crown absolutely, but what else could you do? Let's just think. Uh, if you've been to my previous lectures. I would be like, what other treatment would you do for this patient knowing what she has, right? Let's look at the whole mouth. What would you do to, uh, let's say, if this patient was your sister or your mom? Replace the molar, I would say. That might help. Replace the molar with the implant here, correct? This one? 
Yeah, that will take the load Which, off. Awesome. The seven the load off. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, Dr. Yeah. Sarkis Vira says occlusal splint. Okay. But occlusal splint is fun, but it's not a treatment. It's just to reduce yeah. the effect of forces. Good point. That'll ortho? Be uh, Philip says ortho. Ortho. Yeah. Okay. How, how would ortho help here? Really not that relevant in a dental. I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. We can write, I can author. Yeah, you can just type it through. Um, correct the bite more favorable. Okay, to correct the bite more favorably, answer a little bit of orthodontics. Uh, okay, uh, Christina, I'm going to ask you this question. How would orthodontics help in here? Is there, if there's orthodontics in town, please talk to me. Yeah. Move, move the um, four, seven more mesially. Okay, that will open the bite. Now it'll close the bite, sorry. It'll close the bite. Yeah. Okay, you have lesser room in, you, and you get four, six in the correct dimension because it's quite big, okay? You can be a bit more measurely, but in a sense, is the patient, she's about, you know, 45, 50. Is there anything else you would consider? That's one point. Um, it's just, remember, it's a short clinical crown. Um, Joffrey says, uh, build canines to give some canine guidance to protect the bite. Um, upon lateral movements. Fair enough, but still centric. Just, you still get a crown that tooth or some sort of treatment is required. How are you going to create the room? Remember, if you reduce this tooth, there'll be hardly anything here. See, I'm trying to avoid what right. happened in the previous clinical scenario, right? You have to go way down. I'm trying to avoid that. Reduce the tooth and then put a, an onlay. Yeah, but again, uh, you actually, that's one way, but there's a good chance that online may not work, Christina, because you need a bit more to it. I need, I need this full area if I'm going to do anything this too. If you get an onlay, you can put a, uh, you know, you can place like a gold or some sort of Emacs platform, but if you do that, something happens to occlusion. So how would you deal with that? You, you need a 4-6. Right. Spread the load. Spread the load. Okay. But this is a very short crown. Yeah, but it wouldn't have to take so much load if it was if it was shared with a friend. <laughs> Great friends. Four six seven four seven. Okay. Well, look, that's one way of doing it. Dr. Sarkis Bibik writes Dahl's appliance. Ah, I think that's what he's meaning to say. Is Dahl's appliance? I think so. You would consider Dahl concept because yeah. first we need to build the smile. So we build the anterior gardens, improve the aesthetics. You open the bite, and then you have room to play with. And if this erupts, great. You have a bigger clinical crown, but the rest of the people erupt, so you have more room to play. You may choose open the bite. <laughs> and place it like a nice composite overlay here that will maintain and clear from the lateral occlusion excursions and let the occlusion settle. Then you have an ample room to be able to build your ceramic onlay. <laughs> if you want to do a full type of crown, then you can actually have a bonded crown here. To me, that's not an issue. Don't need a PFM there. That makes sense. It's a simple solution. So you, you're resolving aesthetic problem. You're resolving your anterior gardens. In other words, you mutually protect the occlusion, anterior posterior disclusion, and anterior gardens. That's your mutual protect occlusion. So that's the sort of scenario we need to think in terms of managing these cases. All three on that. Yes, no. Does yes, anyone understand or they don't? If you don't understand, I'm happy to talk about it. Keep moving. I'll keep moving. Yep, no questions okay. so far. Okay, well, there you are. So we manage this clinical case very well. So when you think about it, the problem with this preps, there's problems, they're not simple. See, if you say to me, well, I remember Sharada, you were telling me, Dr. Sark has teach me veneers. And I said, I cannot teach you veneers. Oh God, am I in the picture now? Please don't ask me questions. <laughs> because, it's a good question to ask. Everyone asks the same question. And you say, teach me how to do crowns. So that's fine. But then 
we have to know how do we get impression down there and then how do we fit the crown to make sure that we have a perfect margin seal, you know, five millimeters below the gums. Have you thought about that? Or we like to put those crowns so the margins disappear and the patient looks at us and says, great, fantastic. But years later, they have other problems. That's when I end up seeing all these patients. So we went ahead and placed the crown. We got a great seal here. I'd always take X. Do you ever take X's when you place crowns? How many, how many of you take X-rays when you place crowns? Or you don't see it? I always take X-rays. I always want to know exactly where I am, especially approximately. Buckle and lingually, I can feel it. But here, I have an overhang. Okay? So shall I blame Alex, my technician? Let's blame him. Look, he's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fantastic guy. Why should I blame myself when I have Alex there and it's all your fault? And the what are you talking about? No, that person. So the, the, the issue is the following, okay? The type of preparation at the time I chose this margin. I said, it's going to stand right here and it's going to finish it there. But I knew that if I have a problem, look at your bone. It ends up here, the bone. Here's your biologic width that's left. Is it going to bother me? Not really. There's something will bother me later on, but not at the moment. Okay. And so from here, what I do, I call it burnishing. So I will sit down and burnish that margin because I can burnish the gold. Okay, but you keep the zero with zirconia. There's more to it. There's more to it, you see. There's far more to it. So when I go back now, when I go back, we actually can fix the margin now. Can you see that? It's all fixed. Okay. How good is this margin? I mean, if you think about this little two. Yeah, I'm the bottom to take the car and get it out. Okay. Uh, and here's the gum margin here. It's about there, the gum margin. Okay. So way below. That was the original here, the margin of the crown. So we got this, I feel, correct. Okay. And this is a normal practice. Okay. This is normal practice every day. And... Uh, but, you know, the thing is that if you put any kind of zirconia, you just have resin margins, how do you remove the resin from here? Patients already got some pain and bone loss. Look at that, there's some bone loss here. So you put resin here that you can't see, you're going to have a problem. This is what I'm trying to say, okay? Is you're going to think about the consequences of your treatment. Some cases are complex. This is how we teach you at the college. Think, you know, endpoint position, talk about your treatment plan when we discuss all your cases. You know, we're gonna have you know, 20 people, each one has five cases, you have 100 cases on board, and that's a learning atmosphere for those every two day on face-to-face, -face. plus you have the tutorials. There's almost 80 hours of learning every month, every two months. So there's a huge learning process we go through. We design your restorations. That's where you know what's the perfect, you know, preparation margin because that allows you to think case by case basis and make decisions as you go. And the important part of it is that when you go ahead and you know have your occlusion, you can see the crude test for a resistance and retention. We turn this, we turn this, we turn this, and then we try to tap it. And then there's my Good well, call okay. I'll say just tap it. No, no, that's Tap it again. Wait. No. Tap it. There. Okay. That's my that's my crude test. And in many ways, you know that you have a good resistance. So what am I thinking here? Is your preparations has to be as parallel as possible to allow fitting. Okay. You can't go nine degrees because one fit, one seat. Okay. 10 degrees is ideal, but you can never achieve it. That's why we have boxes and grooves. I use uh, um, the number number one flat fissure bird to create my grooves. And most importantly, we use a biologic cement, way down south gingerly, and the cement extrudes everywhere, everywhere. 
And this allows me to allow it to set for about good 10 minutes. So when you flake it off, the whole flake just comes right out and everything below is just a water floss. And there's a technique of removing that cement. But nevertheless, the idea is to uh, you know, understand that why have I not changed my line of thinking? Why have I not changed embracing new concepts? Just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's better. So we had 30 microns around this gold margin that's subgingival. Most of the time, this grabs a frication. You can see that I've drawn my margin and Alex knows exactly where to finish it. There's no guessing game. He can't remove the crown back and forth trying to fit the crown to my goal because if I see this thing wearing out, I say, you fit it, it didn't fit my turn. <laughs> okay, looking at different angles. Dr. Okay. Sarkis, we have a question from Nitin. He says, any recommendations for cements? For uh, metal ceramic zinc phosphate. I'll teach you the course how to mix it. Okay. <laughs> Most happy to teach. It's, it's going to be a fantastic course. I'm getting so oh, many, yes. you're getting a <laughs> lot, of, lot of inquiries and a lot of people are booking it. So one of the important things is that you can see as we sit those margins, these are 30 microns, okay? Zinc phosphate cement is about 15 microns, okay? So that Alex will have about, Alex, how many microns is your, um, uh, we make allowance for the, the uh, for um, spacer? You make like 30 microns spacer? How much do you allow? He's not there. Okay. This is in trim because- Marcus, about yeah. 35? Yeah. I'm sorry? Eh? Uh -huh. Can you say that again? Harry, is that you? Let me hear the quick. Yes. Alex. No, it's 35. We, we for the 35 microns. But that 35 microns is only inbuilt in when you actually mill the wax pad, aren't you? Yeah, correct. Right. So that this is, we use the digital technology to our advantage here. We use the milling technology to our advantage, okay? Because the milling can be done, uh, of the wax milling can be done, you know, by just a milling unit. Um, and uh, that will fit very well. It's, it's done according to dimensions of the shrinkage factor, et cetera. It's all done very well now. But you can get really good adaptation on these margins for this patient. So, uh, when we talk about the high gold, that was going to answer your question. The clinical question initially was asked. It's a high noble gold. It's a bioprompto star gold. Is that correct, Alex? Correct, it is, yes. Okay, it's 80% uh, gold. Uh, so it's very, very high gold. And then we go later with gold plate on top of that. That gives you a really nice finish. Also, when I'm fitting the crown with the gold plating, it's like a feet checker. It tells them exactly where it's sitting, where it's not. So you don't get margins like this. It's, it's really, really important. And again, uh, the system has a give and, and the way it grabs the tooth, it reinforces it. And it is an art. You do need a master technician to, to do this for you. And uh, me, Alice and Harry, we spent days and weeks in the lab trying to perfect this system, you know, to get it right. And we did get it right. We have years of experience in here. But the point I'm trying to make is that you could never do this with zirconia. And when people tell me, well, you know what, to get rotation of the molars, I'm glad no one said do crown length in the molar molar. Because if you consider crown length in the molar, it's the most morbid procedure ever. It's you're already subjecting the tooth into, uh, you know, with a maybe garden prognosis into poor prognosis or question prognosis. So we like to, uh, you know, we like to get away from vacation air as much as possible. Although, the part of the gold, the design of the crown, you can see here, how it goes around and grabs the root, and that gives you a good seal. And this is what I, I think today, that you know, the, this technology has been around for a long time, since the 50s. But somehow, it's very easy to mill something and throw it in the mouth, because you're not gonna get the level of fit and the level of biologic seal as you would have with metal ceramic that's done this particular way and zinc phosphate and zinc phosphate doesn't bond bonding the tooth doesn't mean anything to me because 
When I remove the zirconia crowns, I see a black, like micro leakage all around. That just hasn't bonded. It's been leaking for a long time. Whereas when you cut a 30 year old uh, in a metal ceramic crown, you can still see the white zinc phosphate. That means it was a seal. And that's the key because that's uh, experience. It tells you the time looking back in time. So I wonder when we look forward in time with all the root canal therapy teeth that have been zirconia crown, how many root thrashes are going to be and how many implants are going to end up doing because of that. So looking further, the answer to the question of biologic weight of one millimeter, uh, you know, um, attachment and connective tissue being 2.04 mil. This has been quoted in literally millions of times. The problem is that before we think about that, and before we think about defining any parameters, because we are told to think that way. So you're told to do this. So you never question it. You're just told to do this. That's why you're doing a postgraduate education at the college, because we start questioning those dogmas. We start questioning about what works and what doesn't. And we learn more from our mistakes than we learn from our success, because that's when you start thinking, what did we go wrong? Uh, and it's called contingency planning. So, you know, if you think about, do we use magnification to examine our dyes? I mean, I do. Copper plate dyes, trim our own dyes, make our margins, communicate in detail with the laboratory. Okay, you know, you got WhatsApp today, you got Zoom today, you know, get a picture, send it to me, let me have a look. Examine the fiddle crowns under the dyes under magnification before cementation. Okay, and finally, use cement so you can easily remove the excess. So to me, when you talk about biologic wheat, well, it's not the wheat, it's not the biologic wheat violation. It's the margin integrity and smoothness of transition from restoration to the tube of root surface. Well, root surface more likely because you're right down there, okay? And importantly is you just can't have cement in that junction. Low the rest of cement, you can't see them, but zinc phosphate, you can see them. So most of the time we have failed the anterior crown, the dentist couldn't see those rest of cement because he couldn't see them. I can't see them either. When I'm doing even so many courses of an easy max crown, I'm actually come back next day so I can get in there and finish it because I just can't see them. Okay. So again, on the final lecture, now, we have to plan for results and not for recipes or for procedures. Having said that, uh, because of COVID, the course we're going to do, short day course, we're going to delay for a while. There's more courses coming up, but uh, we are, we've so had to delay the intake, uh, not the intake, but we take the students, but we're going to delay the start day to about December, January. And I do apologize because of COVID, it's about certain times, but nevertheless, uh, I think Natasha and uh, Kshada will be organizing a Zoom seminar yep. where I will go for the course in detail and answer a lot of the questions that the students have. Questions? Yep. Um, any questions you have for this course or for my course or for this lecture, um, I'm happy to talk. Let's just wait for a minute, maybe. Um... You know, somebody might just uh, ask us regarding either the course or for today's webinar. I'm happy to answer any of the questions. Yeah. I'm sure it's been an interesting day. It's never boring, myself. Alex, any question you might have? I mean, you probably see from from my end of the point of view very well. I'm not sure if Harry's watching it, but uh, 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 it's it's always good to see the clinical aspect of it. Um, I mean, once I get the impression, I know like spe spe Specific, specifically for this post and cause, like I yeah. know exactly what I got to do and where the, where we've got to finish it, and I know I know where we're going to end up with it. But it's the lead up in those photographs which was really interesting. You know, like you know, you, you patient presents themselves with a a broken tooth. Like mm. how how did, how did it happen? When did it happen? Mm -hmm. You know, the history. The history. Yeah, well, what's what's the story behind it? You know. Sure. And then, and then there were so many different suggestions made on how to treat that, and that case could have gone so many different ways, you know. And whether, uh, you know, I think, I mean, with the implant, 
um, solution. I know she didn't want it, but I mean, you know, you, I think you did really well to maintain that tooth and preserve it because you weren't going to lose any bone, any soft tissue, you know, the interproximal pupilla between the uh, already fairly compromised to one. So I, I think a lot gets overlooked by preserving the natural tooth, especially in that anterior uh, high smile region, because you lose so much. Once that root comes out, it, it's a downhill slope, you know, and if you actually get to maintain anything, you, you, you sort of got lucky really, you know? Um, you know, it's funny you say that, right? And I see, I see that all, all the time because people come to see me for shades for single centrals. And sometimes I see plenty of soft tissue and other times, you know, you can see the half moon wall of the root surface, interproximal root surface on the adjacent teeth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, then they say, will this be covered? And it's a really difficult question to answer when the patient hasn't been educated or, you know, a treatment plan has been initiated without any final. That's, um, that's, so, that's so important. You yeah. see, it, it's interesting. When people go like one or two of their courses, right? They, they, they listen to what the clinician has to say. But how, do, how does a clinician talk to his patients? How does a clinician approach his patient? How does he talk to his patient in terms of making them understand that they understand their own. So in other words, if the patient doesn't know the problem, your treatment will be fine, no matter what. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the most important part of this diploma is thought-provoking process. When people sit down and say, you know what? No one actually told me this. Because it's okay, when we look at the case, I mean, the next week's let you be implant, um, we all about implant restorative failure and implant failure. And a lot of it's cost Iatrogenically, it's not the patient's fault. It hasn't been planned well. Because, you know, most of the problems occur when I, so we place the reconstructive work and send the patient back to the dentist. And they decide to put a new crown opposing, which hasn't fit within the closure prescription. The whole thing goes haywire. Because everything sometimes is a fine line, especially if you have a compromised dentition, compromised foundation, right, of course, you know, that you're going to put crowns on or rebuild them. They're all compromised. So it's about forces and how to think. Uh, and, you know, uh, you, can, you can ask any question on Facebook and see all the stuff they present in, you know, most of the forums. It doesn't mean much because that's just what it looks like that point. I want to see that case in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time. See, you start thinking about risk assessment. You just start thinking about the cases. That's why... We stress about contingency planning and patients to understand. I've been telling patients, I haven't seen you for a while. And if I don't see within six months, maximum one year, I said, I'm not responsible for this. I have no idea. You take your car for a service, but you can't take your math for a service. I mean, give me a break. You know, like you broke those teeth in the first place. Like the, those front tooth broke and the same forces that make fracture the front tooth will be acting on the implants and will start breaking the screw of the button screw or the prosthetic screw. And, and the patient said, well, you didn't do that properly, but you know very well that patients are in that too. Are you going to make an occlusal splint? But occlusal splint is not a penicillin, you know. People don't wear the splints. 10% of patients are only compliant. So you have to make your restorations that can take the test of time. And that's important. Someone's going to tell you that. It's all right to say on the Facebook, fantastic job. You did a great job. But I like to say, I want to see this case in five years' time. Okay? Because I want to see how it works. Oh, it's prescription. Can I go? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Nice, can I go? Maybe 10 years' time would be group function. Who knows? You have to explain to the patients. Planning is the key. Thing is the key. That's why uh, when I say we're going to do a diagnosis and photography, you know, you got to think and see what you're thinking and think what you're seeing. You see, there's a difference between looking and seeing. There's a difference in recognizing, you know, what the eye cannot see, the mind cannot recognize. I wrote this years ago, now it's become a cliche. And, uh, and the importance of occlusion and in a patient got TMD, once they have reconstruction, how do you deal with that? So all this is so important part of good dentistry. Now you can learn about implants. 
you know, there's a diploma in implants. People say, why don't you run the diploma implants? Oh. It doesn't mean anything to me. So implant is part of prosthodontics. I can teach a monkey how to drill a bone, open a gum, drill a bone, and put an implant. But if you haven't planned a fun restoration, your occlusional parameters, then unfortunately, we're not clinicians, we are just monkeys. Do you understand? Because your dental rep is forcing you to buy the equipment, buy all the set. Okay, and after you put five or six implants, you pay thousands for that set and you realize what a waste of time. That's what happens usually. You know, I get dentists come to me and say, Cypress, I've been using for 10 years here. You want to use it? I mean, I understand that. I've been through that myself at one point. Okay, the most important thing is diagnosis and planning. You're a good diagnostician. You can plan well, you do both together. How do you get information on the patient? It's an art. How to talk to the patient? It's an art. We teach you that. No one will teach you that because I'll give you a recipe, but I'm going to teach you how to catch a fish. I'm going to teach you how to eat a fish. And that's what we teach. A good teacher teaches the student how to think. And that's pretty good. Sarkis, we have a question from uh, Roya. Uh, can you please explain why you used composite resin to change the bite on 47 tooth? I don't really know what's this. Um... Not 47. Yeah. I will build that. If you go to previous lectures, we talk about dull concept. Mm -hmm. You're going to build from canine to canine, build a whole new platform and open a bite and be posterior of a bite. Okay. On patients that have got no TMD, this is the ideal solution because it allows an orthotic movement of teeth erupting and touching each other. So we can gain about three millimeters or the facial height. And that gives me room to place the compass in the posterior molar. If it doesn't erupt or it wants to stay there. So we have a number of options. Why don't you have, have a talk to me, uh, ask me the questions. So I'm happy to answer this question. It's very important that you understand from today's lecture. Uh, Placing composite, yep. No, 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 no questions yet, sorry. Okay, okay. So you can't just place, you can actually place a composite on a single molar in an intruder. You can, but it's a fracture too, so I wouldn't take the risk. Okay, and, and sometimes uh, as a prophylactic measure, I place an overlay on a tooth on a single molar and I'll live on a high occlusion. If they have no TMD patient, usually they adapt and the bar changes. See, inclusion is a dynamic process, and you have to understand. Any other questions? Uh, none so far, Dr. Sarkis. Okay. Uh, well, if there's no questions, I'm happy to say goodbye to everyone. Um, and um, if you have any questions, write to the college. Uh, Dr. Sarkis, we've got one from Vera before we leave. Um, would you place an Emax only on 4.7 after opening VD? Yeah, Emax, I would. I don't have a problem with it. Because it's bonded. It's all enamel. I can bond it. It's not a problem. There was a weak tube. I placed PFA, metal ceramic. But Emax, <coughs> yeah. it'll be very shy. It'll, be, it'll sit there like a tabletop because that will hold it together. Okay. Naturally, I'm happy to place gold. That would be my favorite, but it must be the second choice if the patient has. But I would put zirconia, no way. Or four. Doesn't anything. If there's plenty of enamel, use Emac. Uh, another question from Alex. Um, it says, Dr. Sarkis, uh, would the option of bonding zirconia with the resin cement to improve retention on the 3.7 give a higher long-term prognosis than a gold coin a gold crown with zinc phosphate cement you have over 70 year research with gold crowns i couldn't compare it with uh with a um, five-year research on zirconia crown okay but a good question we always like to make ourselves feel better because it just you know it's like the uh gestalt triangle you have uh, three dots and they answer what it is. They say it's a triangle because I can join the three dots. And somehow the companies have really tried to tell us that zirconic crowns are really good. There are areas where zirconic crowns. I can tell you where. All right. Uh, for instance, uh, if uh, uh, I have um, supragingival margins and the tube is broken and 
I don't want to go deep subgingivally and I can stay on top and I'm using implants and in that particular situation, zirconia crown the color so they'll fit it well. I might use zirconia, uh, but then again, I don't rely on cement. I use the resin subgingival, but that's not relying on cement for bonding. It's purely retention. That's no problem. And uh, uh, I don't have to, pre uh, and the tube has been so prepared. So it's going to fit the bills. It's very rare, rarely. So that's an I coin, but I'd rather than if there's enough enamel left, I'll probably go Emax all day long because I can bond it. I can really, truly bond it. Uh, one more question from Nitin. I think this is regarding the previous anterior case. Uh, yeah. What's your opinion on direct para post with composite core question as compared to the custom made post and core? Good question. That's a very good question, Nitin. Thank you for asking. Uh, you'll be a fabulous student, I can tell you. Um, my question will be following. Okay, following. And I need to qualify this. When we do. Um, rounded stainless steel post with a composite. Okay, let's go back here. Okay. Your composite is going to, your post is going to come, can I draw? It should be a draw, excuse me. I want to see if I can draw. No, I should be able to draw, shouldn't I? Oh, yes. Uh, I'll go yellow. Okay, good. Okay. Let's say your composite is going to be, you're going to put your post here, correct? Sorry about my drawing here. I can draw better normally, but that's your post. And then, and then I'm going to use another color. And then you're going to draw your, um, and then you can have your composite post like that. Correct? Sorry, I can't rub that. Would that be correct? Yes. Try right, to so your post. It's your composite. Okay, about there, maybe you can go a bit longer. Okay, you know, or over here. Okay. Now you can say, well, you know what, um, we're going to put a fiber post or a metal post. Okay. There's no reason why you can't do it. But here's my take on this. The data shows that cast posts just improve the resistance far more. It's Sarkis on Forum, uh, 2016, an article. Of, if you want, write your college, I'll send you an article. And uh, we get far more tested with a cast post and core than any other system. And the data indicates the, we call it uh, forest box plots. When you do a forest box plot, you do a risk analysis and gives you the confidence interval, which way that way. So um, I love statistics, that's what I'm talking about. But, but basically, data shows that um, with, with cast pose, you improve the rigidity, uh, and especially when there's a minimal furl involved. If, you have a, if, this were, if this tube was further up here, okay, I wouldn't have a post. I would need a post. So post is really to retain the core. So this foundation restoration is giving a strength to my tooth. We don't really know. But what's the most important here is the remaining tooth. If we have a cast post that's actually fitted, okay, and it's passively cemented, any pressure that happens goes straight from here all the way down there, and it's stabilized. But most important here is the occlusion because you cannot load this system to the extent that you loaded before. So um, you can use in a situation where you got an alternative stainless steel round prefabricated post with composite, as long as you can really bond the composite. Okay, remember you're gonna bond the composite. Okay, I know how you're gonna do that. That's why, uh, and then your crown will have to come and go straight deep and cover all that. It's a possibility, but will be the second best option than a cast. Good question. Dr. Sarkis, Alex is asking, uh, does the increased rigidity of the cast post increase the risk of root fracture? Yeah. And Nitin Solanki yeah. says, thank you so much. No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, uh, people just say fiber posts have got the same modules of elasticity as the root system. It probably is another lecture happening today we're going to talk about somewhere else, but it improves rigidity because of basically 
it's the same, it's got the same modules with less than 15. And that what does it really mean that it's not going to fracture. So the aim is if you if you get a two, put a fiber and build a composite and get a plier, try to break it, get the same to same mesh for a cast post, try to break it. It's gonna be hard to break the cast post. So breakage is not the issue, it's the forces involved and how the forces are transmitted along the route is called epic, it's called coronal epical stabilization. And if you understand those forces. If you ask those von Mises forces, okay, how it's transmitted along the root system, then you realize that the cast post gives you better stability because parental membrane, it moves this whole one. You don't want to have any flexibility in the system that the fiber post does, okay? And that's why if you've got three, four, five millimeter ferrule, four millimeter ferrule, you don't need a post. Am I making sense? You just don't need a post. Post doesn't improve the strength of the turf system. That is the fiber bonded post or any other post, but the cast post has been shown to improve that stiffness a lot better than any other post system. Give a whole data to prove that. I definitely wouldn't use zirconia post in the system. Okay, I just wouldn't do that. Metal has got that give. Okay, it has to be a passive fit. Now, when you place the post, you're just going to drop it, it should be not binding, and then bring it, take it out. Drop it and take it out. So, a post system for me, I'll just take it out there, it drops, that's fine with me. It's passive. That's the only test I have. So, it can't be binding. If it's binding, find out and adjust, it should go. This is why we copper plate it here so that there's a hole there, and Alice can easily place his wax pattern and fill up in between them and, and, and and uh, cast that system and then go back in there and try and make sure it's passive. So that's one of the tests we do for this case. I was an answer to your question. If there's more, please tell me I'm happy to answer it. Uh, one last question, I think that's from Sri Priya. Right. Uh, what type of gold is recommended for cast post? Same, uh, same. Alice, use the same code, post, same gold. Yeah, it's yellow gold. It's, oh, okay. You, so you, it's, yeah. it's a type. It's a type four, isn't it? You put, yes. It's type four. Yes. Yeah. Type four. And uh, Vera says thank you, and yeah. Nitin says thank you so much as well. Thank you very much. Well, it's been an interesting day. We'll talk about complications of the implants and the reasons why it happens. Mm -hmm. I will simplify the issues for you. Uh, and, and let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with the implant system. It's uh, how we design restoration. And we'll talk about that in two weeks' time. If you okay. want to bring the seminars forward, make it weak because of COVID shutdown, I'm happy to do it. So talk to me. Happy to do it. Okay, you have to talk to me. Uh, write to um, Natasha Ostrada to, at the, at the um, icodp.com. And be the, the email is on the website. Um, we'll be anyway sending uh, a thank you call and message to everybody tomorrow who's attended the webinar. Thank you so much. Um, everybody else says thank you to you as well, Dr. Sarkis. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, sincerely hope to see you again. And uh, uh, at this college, we teach. So that's what we do. And it's given information given to you freely so you understand and help your patients and grow your practices. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sarkis. No, it's a fantastic oh, lecture. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> got to learn a lot. Thank you, Thank Doctor. You. Thank you. Was Bye, Dr. Sarkis. Time? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Good night. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.